Hello and welcome to our webinar series, What's New at AmericanAncestors.org. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Your presenter is Associate Director of Database Content, Molly Rogers. Molly works on our database collections, maintaining the accuracy of current databases, and managing teams of volunteers to help transcribe and add new collections to our website. Originally from York, Pennsylvania, Molly studied English and French at Colby College in Maine, and has a master's degree in library and information science from Simmons College. After a brief introduction to our website, Molly will highlight our newest databases and additions to our digital library and archives. Then we'll discuss a few projects that are in progress and wrap up with questions from you, our listeners. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel, um, at, into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is no handout for this presentation, but as always, we are recording this event and starting later today, you can easily go back and review the presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So if you miss something Thing on today's first listen. Don't worry, you can always go back, pause, rewind, um, take your time and really uh, digest the presentation at your own, um, according to your own schedule. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Molly. Hello, welcome to our webinar series, What's New at AmericanAncestors.org. Uh, we'll highlight new resources on our website that were released between October 2021 and this March 2022. Overall, I want to help you understand how to use these new additions to our databases and generally help you make the most of your membership. We'll talk particularly about the databases and the digital library and archive, which are all found in the search menu of our website. So we have 485 databases available for you to search. Um, many of these contain vital records such as births, marriages, and deaths. Many more are censuses and probate records, published genealogies, and scholarly genealogical journals are other important sources of information that are available on our website for you to search. 220 of our databases are unique. You can only find them here on AmericanAncestors.org. So uh, our databases come from a wide range of locations. Uh, we have records from all 50 states and many countries. We definitely specialize in New England resources, but if your ancestors come from a different area, you'll definitely want to look at our database collection and see if we do have any information that pertains to the particular location and time period where uh, your ancestors may be from. So this webinar is not exactly how to search AmericanAncestors.org. We're more going to talk about what's new. I hope we will give you some tips for understanding how to interact with and search through the online content available. But if you want to learn more about how to search AmericanAncestors.org in the tools section of our website, you'll want to click on video library. And then I wanted to highlight uh, two webinars in particular that will be very helpful to you. My colleague Claire Vale recently gave a Zoom demo about how to use our new website, AmericanAncestors.org. We recently, in about November, had a big site redesign and Claire goes through all the new features. Um, so that will be really helpful. And I have an older webinar called Searching Databases on AmericanAncestors.org. And so the site design is going to be our older design but the pages discussed in the webinar are all the same pages we'll look at today. Um, those underlying functionalities haven't been changed. So for more tips on how to search our databases, these are two great places to start. And then also in that tools menu, um, we have research guides. Um, so this is more sort of the written out version. Uh, this subject guide 
tells you all about how to navigate our website, search our databases, and leverage other tools to advance your family history research. Our presentation today uh, basically summarizes the contents of our blog, databasenews.americanancestors.org. And so this is where uh, my team, the database team, announces new data when it's added to our website as it happens. Um, so if you're really excited about our ongoing projects, uh, you may want to subscribe and you can receive email updates every time we publish something new. If you don't want to subscribe, you may want to come to our site and use the search this site function um, so you can type in keywords to find uh, different things that you might be looking for. For example, we'll talk about the Catholic Records Project in a moment. If you're interested in finding out which parishes are available where on our website, uh, you could type in the parish name here. So we're sort of splitting our conversation today between the databases and the digital library and archive. I'll try and explain what the difference between those two repositories are. Um, and so the DLA will handle in the second half of the presentation, and it's also available in the search menu. In the Digital Library and Archive, there are over 700,000 pages of genealogies, diaries, letters, case files, and more available for you to discover. Um, and you sort of, our databases are more event uh, focused. So if someone, something happened to a person at a place at a specific time, that's a great candidate for something that would uh, appear in our databases. Whereas the Digital Library and Archives, local histories, diaries, things that are more narrative, um, these are things that you will genuinely, generally find in the digital library and archive. So we're going to start with database updates that happened in the past six months. So to get started, we're going to click on the A to Z list of all our databases in the search menu. This will take you to our list of all 485 databases. Um, and if you are unsure if our databases fit within your research interests, I strongly encourage you to peruse this list and look at the locations and the year ranges and see if those different uh, criteria fit within your research interests. In this screenshot, I've used the search by database name bar to filter this list on our um, databases that pertain to our project with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston. Um, so you could search this on another keyword, say you're interested in Mayflower databases or databases pertaining to the state of Vermont. Um, I, I really like this database keyword search bar because you, you sort of get interesting combinations. You're not looking for all our vital records databases or all our um, census records databases. You, you can kind of combine categories to see what might be available for a given keyword. So this Catholic example takes us to our first uh, new thing that we're gonna talk about. Massachusetts image only Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston records 1789 to 1920 is the free database available to our users uh, pertaining to the Catholic records project. So we've added 21 new parishes, 103 new volumes, uh, which comes to over 1500 complete volumes available in this database. If you go to the next slide, you can see that this is a browsable database. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to search than most of our databases, which are fully searchable. Um, so back in the video library, you'll want to find our recent webinar, Archdiocese of Boston Catholic Records Project, we're expanding, um, where this was uh, from either one or two years ago, and we talked about what was new at the time. And in it, I explain exactly how to uh, navigate that browsable collection. So this is an update on the fully searchable version of the same data. In the past six months, we've added 45 new parishes and 174 new volumes. Um, again, we have just over 1,500 volumes available and 15 million searchable names have been added to this database over the course of the whole project. We're really excited about that number and we're gonna keep going and adding more data to this project. 
Um, as I said, if you're curious about which parishes are available uh, using the database news blog to search on the parish name, or in this uh, screenshot, you can see the volume menu. This appears on a few different pages on our website, and you can kind of expand that volume menu and browse through it uh, to also see which parishes are available. And just for people who are particularly interested in this collection, right now there's a little bit of a mismatch between which parishes are available in the free collection and which parishes are available in the searchable collection. But by the time we wrap up this project, each of them should have exactly the same information. It's just been a little quirk of how uh, we've been uploading parishes lately. So I wanted to go through a quick example of how you would use this database that's also going to show you um, sort of how you would use any of the databases that we're going to talk about today. From the Browse Databases A to Z page that we looked at earlier, you can click on the database name and that will take you to this page, which is the database specific search page. And so what's really great about this page is all of the fields that appear on the page are specific to the database itself. So you can see this one has a confirmation name because that's information that's available in these Catholic records. Um, some databases aren't indexed on quite all of this information. So if you couldn't search on family members' names, this field would be missing from the page. So to, to make your search a little bit easier, you wouldn't want to put in information that we don't have indexed and not, not be able to find anything. So if you scroll down on this page, we have some more information that can be helpful to your research. We have search tips that again, articulate exactly which fields are available for search. We have sample images to help you understand what you might find in this database. And we have the database description, which tries to help you understand what you're, what you're viewing on the website. Um, is this an item from our manuscript collection? Is it a book? archives of the Archdiocese of Boston, we want you to really understand where did this information come from? Is it object? Is it compiled genealogical research that has a specific genealogist has done? Um, so hopefully the database description can help you understand what you're interacting with on our website. So I did a sample search in the Catholic records and here you can see that I was looking for the baptism of a girl named Maria Lupo, and now we've found her baptism and her birth records. And you can see that for this database in particular, we the original records may be written in Latin, and we've tried to offer an anglicized alternative uh, to help you with your searching. Maria is like a pretty, the, the um, sorry, I'm stumbling. The, uh, Latin version and the Anglicized version are pretty similar. Uh, there are some other names like uh, William, where the Latin version is very dissimilar from our name William. Um, so this is to help you be able to search. You don't have to know what the Latin version of your ancestor's name is uh, to find them. So then if you clicked on view image, that will take you to this page. I've zoomed in on Maria's birth and baptism records, and you can see that she was born in October in 1916. And it looks like we even have the place in Italy where her parents were from, somewhere in Cosenza. Um, so that, that it could be really exciting information if you're researching this family. An additional tool that is available if you're interested in this research topic is the parish boundary map. Um, this can be found in the database description that we discussed. And so if you click on this link, that will take you to the page. And so if you're not certain where your ancestors worshiped, um, especially if you're using the free collection where you'll, where you'll need to be looking in a specific parish, um, then this parish boundary map, if you have an address from a census or some other material, you can type in the address and find within which parish uh, that, that address may be found. So on the next page, it works a little better if you use Map Viewer Classic. So you can see this blue button that says open in Map Viewer. If you click the little arrow, 
uh, that will give you the option to use Map Viewer Classic instead. And then we'll look at an example. I zoomed in on the Lowell and Lawrence areas. Both of these towns have a lot of churches in a small area. Um, so this can help you sort of understand what church your ancestor might have attended, uh, what the parish boundaries looked like. Um, and if you click on any of these specific churches, you'll get information about when they were um, established and when they closed. So these boundaries reflect what the archdiocese looked like in about 1955. But if you look at the surrounding churches, you can get some ideas for other places to look if, you know, this church didn't exist at that particular time. And so just a little bit more on the topic of Catholic records. Uh, we have a companion database called Massachusetts Catholic Cemetery Association records from 1833 to 1940. And this database contains uh, the records held by the Catholic Cemetery Association that is affiliated with the Archdiocese of Boston. Uh, we've added four new cemeteries to this database and uh, we have now fully completed this database, which is exciting and news as of this update. And it has 200,000 new names that were part of this update. Similarly to the parish boundary map, uh, the Archdiocese has also made cemetery maps available for people to research. So here you can see I have two screenshots. The page was just a little too long to fit it into one, um, where if you're on the database uh, description, uh, sorry, the database specific search page, you can scroll down to the database description. Um, and here is the list of cemeteries that are part of this project. And you can click the link to see the maps. There are three cemeteries that don't yet have maps available, um, but the Archdiocese is working on making them and they'll be coming soon. So here's an example of what one of the maps look like. And in the database description, you can find a short tutorial video for uh, understanding how to interact with and use the maps. So a new topic, We've added 10 sketches to our database, Early Vermont Settlers, 1700 to 1784. Uh, this study project is researched by Scott Andrew Bartley, um, and he's looking at all the heads of families who lived in Vermont prior to the Revolutionary War. Um, so he's looking at different migration patterns throughout this region, uh, trying to identify people's uh, political and religious affiliation. And so right now he's focusing on settlers to, who came to Vermont up to 1771 in the Windsor and Wyndham County areas. Um, so that's like the Southeast corner of Vermont. So I forget whether I said all of these men and families specifically come from the Brattleboro region. Another study project, uh, Alicia Crane Williams is researching early New, early New England families from 1641 to 1700. And we've recently added one new sketch to this database. John Fuller lived in the area of Cambridge at the time that has now become Newton, Massachusetts. Um, and so Alicia bases her work on uh, our database, New England Marriages to 1700, which uh, compiles the work of an earlier genealogist, Clarence Allman Torrey. So I wanted to show you on the database A to Z list that we have two databases actually that pertain to this topic. We have a copy of Clarence Torrey's actual manuscript. Um, his handwriting was a little bit messy. So sometimes in the printed version of his work, you might find something that is confusing or you'd like to double check. Uh, so I often, if I'm using this, will reference back and forth between these two sources. Um, I also wanted to point out that Alicia often writes Vita Brevis blog posts about her work. So if you're interested in this, da in this database and this topic, uh, you'll want to look out for her posts on our organization-wide blog, Vita Brevis. So similar to the Catholic cemeteries, this is another ongoing project that we have finished lately. We're very excited to add seven new volumes to the Provident Institution for Savings database on our website. So this was one of the first savings banks to be incorporated in the United States. About 80% of the individuals represented in the early records of this bank were immigrants to Boston. 
Um, the signature books are for people who are like creating an account, whereas the waste books are more lists of daily transactions that happened at the bank. Often one person is depositing money in benefit of another person. Uh, you may find a residence location or an occupation for the people in these books. Um, and sometimes if they're immigrants, you'll get the place where they came from. This is a partnership with the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, so we're really excited to finish up this database. So we've also added to one of our oldest and most popular databases, Massachusetts Vital Records, 1820, sorry, 1620 to 1850. Uh, so this presents many, but not all, the vital records of the towns in Massachusetts at this time. Um, and so these nine towns are from Western Massachusetts and they come from the Corbin collection. So Walter and Lottie Corbin were genealogists who lived in Florence, Massachusetts. And I'm going to read to you from the introduction uh, to the collection. They traveled throughout Western Massachusetts transcribing and compiling records that they, until they had assembled, perhaps the largest and most valuable collection of materials ever created for this area. Um, so they visited individuals in their homes, traipsed through overgrown cemeteries, and carefully examined dusty century old volumes in clerks' offices, libraries, and churches. So in the 2000s, we created a CD out of their manuscripts. And uh, now these nine new towns come from that CD that was created in the 2000s. So we have a wonderful collection of scholarly journals on our website. And many of them, our agreements with the publishers are that we will add a new volume after five years have gone by. Um, so you'll see many of these on the list are our newest volumes that we're allowed to add to our website from 2016. A few of them are published by us here at um, American Ancestors. So you can see the date is a little bit more recent. So we've added to American Ancestors Magazine, the American Genealogist, the Essex Genealogist, the Maine De Genealogist, Mayflower Descendant, the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, Rhode Island Roots, and Vermont Genealogy. So this is all, you know, very new scholarship that will definitely be a valuable resource in your genealogical research. So prior to this slide, we've been talking about ongoing projects that, you know, we've probably covered before in a similar webinar. Uh, now we're going to talk about some new additions to our website. So uh, we're working with the Dartmouth Historical and Art Society on Quaker records from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Um, so the DHAS has digitized and is transcribing original record books from the Dartmouth Monthly Meeting of Friends. Um, these digitized images and transcriptions, when complete, will be available on our website. Some of them are already there. Um, and so we're also creating a database on our website out of this content. Um, when finished, the full database will encompass about 16 volumes pertaining to uh, the monthly meeting, and currently we have removal records from seven of these volumes. So what removal records mean are uh, basically when people were moving around in space. So you can actually see on this page uh, that on the Caleb Green Clark is the clerk, and it looks like someone is coming from Dartmouth to Providence or the opposite. I don't know, I'm reading this quickly as I present to you. Um, and I believe someone else is traveling from, to or from Dartmouth to another place on the other side of the page where the handwriting is much smaller. Um, so uh, these records, we're really excited about the valuable insight that they provide into the lives of early New England Quakers. Speaking of Vita Brevis, I collaborated with um, Bob Harding, uh, to write a Vita Brevis post that tells you more about the history of Dartmouth and Quakers in this area. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, you should definitely look that up. Another new database is Descendants of Nathaniel Woodward from 1630 to 1990. This is based on a book from our library that is called Some Descendants of Nathaniel Woodward Who Came from England to Boston About 1630 by Harold Edward Woodward. So in this book, you can search on parents and spouses' first names. You might find birth, baptism, marriage, death, 
burial residence records. Um, and I believe that the descendants of Nathaniel Woodward sort of spread out across the United States. So you're definitely gonna have a lot of New England records, but uh, it, it definitely has some geographic diversity. And this new database is actually really exciting. We've received some great feedback on it already. Uh, this is Massachusetts automobile registrations from 1908 to 1910. Um, and here you can see the first page of the book uh, has the very first people who registered their cars in the state of Massachusetts. So there's information about their names, their address, and what kind of car they drove. Um, and so it looks like I think Ginevra actually added this picture to the slide for me, and I think it might be one of the cars that is uh, listed on this page. Um, so this is really fun. Uh, even if you didn't have ancestors who had cars in 1908, uh, it's fascinating to see what kind of cars people were driving, where they lived. Um, so the information that we've transcribed for this database includes the town of residence, the manufacturer, and the size of the engine of their vehicles. Um, there's also some appendices with some advertisements where you'll see automobile dealers, garage and supply services, and lodging for people traveling by car. Finally, uh, the last new database that we've added in the past six months is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Gaines Funeral Home Records from 1925 to 1934. This is based on some books in our manuscript collection. Uh, you'll find information about the names of the deceased, dates and locations of birth, death, funeral service, and internment information, and names of their parents or spouses. Uh, you might also have information about their occupation, where they were buried, their age at death, and the name of the attending physician and clergyman. Uh, the Gaines Funeral Home was established by George W. Gaines in 1919 in the historically African-American neighborhood of Homewood in Pittsburgh. Uh, many of the people in this database were buried in Monongahela Cemetery or Allegheny Cemetery. Um, and so, again, uh, a lot of the locations are based around Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, but people were... Uh, born in a bunch of other locations, including places throughout the South. Now we'll transition into discussing updates to our digital library and archive in the past six months. Um, I already talked a little bit about the differences between the databases and the DLA. Uh, we'll see some things that are more sort of narrative based or harder to fit into the strict categories of searching through our databases. Again, this is not how to search the digital library and archive, but again, we'll give you some tips. If you want to dive more into exactly how to use this collection, uh, you should watch Sally, my colleague Sally Benny's webinar, Navigating the Digital Library and Archives at AmericanAncestors.org. And again, you can find this in the tools section of our website in the video library. So just to remind you, here we are back on our homepage. And now in the search menu, we're going to click on digital library and archive. That will take you to this page, the digital library and archive homepage. Um, and so now we're gonna scroll down and you can see the information in the DLA is arranged into three major categories. Um, and that sort of co corresponds to three departments across our organization who contribute content to this platform. So we're going to look at content from the Weiner Fa Family Jewish Heritage Center, the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections, and the Research Library. But we're going to start with the Jewish Heritage Center. So here we are on sort of the JHC homepage. And we're going, in the past six months, they've added to two different uh, repository collections. Um, so we're going to look at community and social organization records and Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Port of Boston records. And um, so if we click on Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, that will take us here. Um, and this 
is sort of like our database description that we talked about before. About this collection, we'll give you all kinds of information about what the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society was and uh, what you might find in these records. You could look at just the recent editions, um, but we're gonna click on browse this collection. Um, and so here I actually just have a slide that's explaining to you uh, what we've added in the past six months. But if you click on browse that collection, it'll be easy to access some of this information and search through it. So we've recently added 614 case files, which come to over 700 pages. Um, to access this database, you can request access from the Jewish Heritage Center. And uh, we wanted to make sure that if you're interested in this topic, that you know about a related database that we have called uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society Immigration Records, 1904 to 1929. So the database presents the earliest records of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Um, they were, you know, a lot of sort of uh, arrival ship lists and a, a little bit of correspondence, um, but here in the DLA, they have information that probably starts right around 1930 and picks up where that the database leaves off. So now we're back to the Jewish Heritage homepage in the DLA. And this time we're gonna click on community and social service organizations. You can see it right at the bottom of this page. So here we are on the community and social service organization records page, and we're gonna scroll down so we can see what collections are available in this category. So the first one we're going to talk about today is records added to the Boston Committee to Challenge Anti-Semitism Records Collection. So this was an organization that was founded in 1978 with the goal to be a group of Jew and non-Jews dedicated to the elimination of anti-Semitism and the sharing of Jewish culture. And so that's a quote that must come from within this collection. And here I just pulled out a couple excerpts. Um, there are a lot of speeches and writings uh, from the people who were on the committee, including uh, some sort of uh, really personal speeches by uh, Holocaust survivors and other people who, I, I really liked this quote. It says, uh, we can build the kind of unity that is necessary to end not only anti-Semitism, but all forms of oppression. So it really feels like a collection of records of people who care about creating connections between people and uh, figuring out ways to, uh, I don't know, stop hate. So now if we go back to that same homepage for the um, community and organization type of records, we have also added to the Ladies Bikor Kolim Society in Roxbury. And so this was a group that was established to help organize the Jewish Memorial Hospital and it contains meeting minutes from 1928 to 1932. Um, and you can see here, this is a list of officers and the board of directors. Uh, so this could be super helpful if uh, it's sort of like an alternate source for finding information about your ancestors. You can see this is a list of names and the addresses of the places that they lived. Um, so I feel like that could be really exciting for genealogists who are looking into, uh, you know, families who lived in Roxbury at this time. So uh, we're not going to look at everything that was added to the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections and the Research Library, but here's an overview of what's happened over the past six months. We've added 22 manuscript family histories, seven small collections of family papers, nine family histories, 11 local histories, one city directory, which comes to over 3,000 pages total. So we'll dive into a few of them. I'm really excited about one that we're going to talk about soon. So here we are, we're sort of skipping all the way back down to the Digital Library and Archives homepage. And we're gonna scroll down again to those different repositories. And so we're gonna start by clicking on the special collections. And this is my favorite thing that I'm talking to you about today. 
Uh, this is the Rundle family hair book. So it's a bound volume that contains approximately 68 instances of ornamental hair work, mourning jewelry, and unwoven locks of human hair with accompanying handwritten identifying entries for the family of David and Sabra Rundell of Crawford County, Pennsylvania. Um, so a lot of pages look like this with uh, ribbons attached to pieces of uh, hair from this family. Um, and I talked with Sally, our archivist, about how this book was digitized. And she said that um, her intern was actually able to really carefully and cautiously lay this on the bed of a flatbed scanner. Um, and the images are, are really great. Um, and I, I believe that she spoke with our conservator before attempting this digitization to make sure that we were being very careful with this special object. Uh, what else about this book? Oh, oh, <laughs> I was telling my partner about this object and that it, the fact that it came from Pennsylvania and he came up with a really bad pun that he might be embarrassed that I'm sharing with you. Uh, but he was disappointed to learn that they were not from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So this is a little bit less exciting, but still uh, great for people who are interested in the history of Kingston, Massachusetts and the Drew family. Uh, this was a diary uh, of Nancy Bartlett Drew, and she wrote between 1847 and 1869. She recorded social calls, weather, local births, marriages, and deaths, and included some clippings from maybe newspapers and other publications. Um, and you, if you just look at this page quickly, I know it's small, but you can see that a variety of people were buried. Um, so it, it contains a lot of really fascinating and interesting genealogical information. We've also added the Rogers family correspondence from the special collections. And so uh, this family lived in the capital of Trinidad and Tobago, Port of Spain in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And they were corresponding with their relatives who lived in New Hampshire. So it's a set of different uh, letters between New Hampshire and Trinidad uh, talking about, I don't know, everyday life at that time. So now we're skipping to some things that came from the research library rather than our special collections and manuscripts. We've digitized the class reports for Harvard's class of 1879. So I guess in the 30s and the 40s, they were writing these reports of what was going on uh, with their classmates who had graduated in 1879. Um, and you can see on this page, there's they're listing information about some grandchildren of this class. Um, so I think there's all sorts of interesting genealogical content that can be found in these reports. And uh, we've also added a city directory for Elliott and York, Maine, uh, which includes York Harbor and York Beach. Uh, so if you're researching Maine families in the 20s, uh, this could be a great way to look up the different businesses that existed at the time. Um, and uh, it might have some fun advertisements. I don't know. I think this is a great resource for people interested in uh, main, main history and genealogy. So I didn't get through highlighting everything that uh, was new in the digital library and archive. Uh, you'll have to poke around and uh, look for yourself to see about things that match with your research interests. Now I wanted to talk about a few projects in progress that we have coming behind the scenes that we're still working on, but we'll definitely announce and talk about in a future webinar just like this. So uh, we are working on a really big project that we're excited about uh, in which we are re-indexing the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. So there are two databases on our website currently associated with this publication. Uh, we have one that is simply called New England Historical and Genealogical Register. And so that's the one we talked about earlier in the presentation briefly. We just recently added the 2021 volume of the register to that database. And so that database is indexed like you're looking at the index in the back of the book you know when a name appears on a page, but you don't have more detailed information than that. So if you're searching a really common name, 
it can be a little bit hard to sort through all the contents and find the information that you're looking for. Um, it is the most up to date, so um, it's a great database. There's just a lot of information in the register that's not captured there. So we have another database called Vital Records from the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. Um, and this was a database that I believe we did as a partnership with Ancestry many years ago. And so some of the Vital Records articles that were in a tabular format uh, were indexed thanks to Ancestry.com. And we presented that information in this database. We're currently redoing the whole thing to index the articles on first name, last name, parents' name, spouse's name, record type, location, years, all of the really detailed record information that we gather in our newest, most up-to-date databases. Um, so currently volumes one through 23 are complete. And as part of this redo, we're often adding uh, up to like eight and nine times the information that was previously available in these, uh, in these specific volumes. So uh, we're currently working on, uh, I don't know, volumes like 24 through maybe the 40s. Um, so we're really excited to have so much in progress. There's definitely going to be more coming soon uh, for this database. So if you're excited about New England research, uh, you should definitely be excited about this project in process. We're also partnering with the General Society of the War of 1812, which is a lineage society that you can join if your ancestor fought in the War of 1812. Um, and so when I say you, I believe it may just be for men. I'm not 100% certain on that. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't confirm before I, I said that sentence. Uh, but uh, so these membership applications, I, I believe they're very fairly common across lineage societies, but you generally have the first page, which has the ancestor and the applicant. Then the next page is usually called the affidavit, and it has information about how the applicant traces their lineage back to the ancestor. Then you have a section which may include uh, supporting materials that go along with that genealogical information. And then finally, you'll have the back page, which often has the date that the membership was approved to the society. Um, so these are not uh, original records. You know, it's not the copy of a birth that was reported to the state, but it can be a copy of your ancestors' ancestry in their own handwriting. Um, so this can be, you, you'll definitely want to verify the information that you find in here, but I think it can be a really exciting uh, artifact that uh, could contribute to your genealogical research, especially for people who are interested in military history. You can see, I, I just took a copy of the first application from Pennsylvania. That was also the first application to the society itself. Um, and this lists uh, the military service history of this, uh, ancestor Peter Hay. So that's an exciting database that is coming soon. Watch out for announcements on database news about when this will become available. So thank you all for following along and hearing about what's new in our databases. Uh, for up-to-date information of when we add new content, you will want to subscribe to database news at AmericanAncestors.org. Uh, we also feature something new in our weekly e-newsletter every week, uh, so it might not be exactly as it happens, but we're, we're talking about the new content that comes to our site there. Uh, and I mentioned Vita Brevis a couple different times in this, uh, in this talk. It is the organization-wide blog uh, that sort of tells more genealogical stories about research and the information available uh, in our databases and the work that we do. So uh, if you have any questions about anything that we talked about today, feel free to email us at webmaster at nehgs.org. Um, so it's myself and my colleague who answer that. Uh, and we're happy to fix typos in our database or help you understand how to find information in our databases. 
All right, well, thank you, Molly, for your fantastic presentation. Before we get to everyone's questions, I did want to tell everyone about a few upcoming programs. So next week we have uh, several programs, including two family history webinars. On next uh, Thursday, Lindsay Fulton will review using the 1950 census and provide tips on using it as really a springboard to other records. Then on Friday, we'll look at the many external databases that you can access from home as a member of American Ancestors. These are other third-party subscription sites. Normally, you would have to pay or have a subscription to some of these sites and institutions but you can actually access them for free through our website um, and in connection with your membership here at American Ancestor. So Melanie McComb will go over some of those resources next Friday. And it's also not too late to register for our in-person seminar, the Genealogical Skills Bootcamp, um, coming up in May at our research center in Boston. You can learn more about these and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. So let's get to um, some questions. Again, if you have anything that you'd like to ask Molly about anything that she's covered, go ahead and type it into the Q&A panel. Um, so first of all, regarding the uh, Archdiocese of Boston Catholic Records Project, Patricia asks, um, will that database include burials, uh, sacramental record, records of burials in the future? So, we present the books that are available in the archive at the Archdiocese of Boston. So it sort of varies by parish, whether burials are available or not. Um, I've noticed that in the French uh, language parishes, they often did keep burial books. Um, so I know Our Lady of Victories in Boston, I think has a few burial books and uh, some of the others like St. John Baptiste in Lowell. Um, but again, it's really going to vary on what the parish kept. Uh, so that's where the uh, Catholic Cemetery Association database might be helpful if you're looking for death information. Um, but it's, you know, it's really not something that's super consistent across the collection as a whole. I would say that if you're interested in um, finding out whether or not that information would exist, you should be in contact with the Archdiocese of Boston Archives. Um, and if you Google them, it's pretty easy to find their email address. I'm not going to say it out to you because I never remember whether it's archive or archives with an S. Um, so you should just Google it and it's easy to find. So you're basically saying that if the um, if it exists, if the burial record kind of exists for the parish and within the time period that we've kind of contracted with the archdiocese, then it should be on the site? Yes. But there's a good chance, I'd, I'd say most parishes don't have the burial record books. Okay, thank you. Um, Gail asks, do the War of 1812 records that you showed, um, the applications to the General Society, um, do those include only applicants from New England or from applicants countrywide? Uh, no, it's the General Society, which means I think you can come from across the country. So the application that we specifically looked at was Pennsylvania, but um, I, I think I, I haven't like completely dove into the work of publishing this database yet. I started it a little bit. There's definitely a lot of people from Pennsylvania. There's a lot of people from New England and I'm, I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes, it covers the rest of the United States, but I haven't noticed any other trends yet of where the really popular areas. I believe a lot of people from Maryland too. Great. Um, let's see, Jeff asks, is there any new content covering New York? Um, I'm thinking especially about some of the journals that we've included. Might you find New York families within some of those journals? Um, I think that is definitely possible. Uh, I don't, we haven't published anything lately that is specifically New York. Um, related, but I know that Henry Hoff, who's the um, author, the editor of the register, he often has a column in one of the journals where he compiles information about new New York resources that are available. And I don't know if that's a historical thing that he did, or if that article is still continuing, and I'm not sure which uh, publication it comes from. 
but <laughs> if you wanted to email webmaster that could be something that i could look into and see if it's ongoing and if it's not ongoing what am i thinking of and where did it come from <laughs> well and also uh maybe to to jeff's question and to other questions about you know what resources do you have on a specific area even if it's not new i mean how would you suggest seeing what databases we really have that may be pertinent to a specific subject or a specific geographic region oh, that's that's a great question and i do have an answer to that um back to the war of 1812 i'm actually sure that we're going to have a lot of new york content uh in the war of 1812 database so that will be an exciting addition when it is ready for our site um, but in the tools menu under the research guides, we definitely have a research guide uh, all about researching your New York ancestors. And I believe Ginevra can uh, definitely correct me. I believe we have a webinar that uh, was fairly recent that covers that topic too. Um, so I would probably start, oh, and on the database A to Z page, uh, you can type in New York and see which databases that aren't exactly new, but um, we do have on our website. So webinar, subject guide, and our database A to Z list of databases searching on a keyword New York. Thanks. Um, so we have a question. Someone's looking for records of a Greek immigrant who lived in Boston or Lynn between 1900 and 1920. Um, he doesn't appear in the census. Is there an index I might search before joining? So um, maybe you can explain if you're if someone's not yet a member of American Ancestors, can you still do a search and see what the results are, um, you know, before joining? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, some of our databases are available to paying members. Some of them are available to guest members, which is a free account. Um, and on our database search page, there's a little um, box that you can check to search only free results if you're a guest member and you want to search only things that you have access to. But it sounds like this person might want to search all of our resources to see what we have available. And you can absolutely do that as a guest. Um, it's just if you go to click on something, you won't be able to see it. Uh, and on the in the join section of our website, there's a page all about guest membership that tells you what you have access to with a free account um, and sort of gives you information about that type of membership. Um, I'm just thinking that. I don't know if this person or their family would be in our Massachusetts vital records collection. I, that, that sounds like our records, I think, are most strong in 1925-ish and before. Uh, so on the screen that we're looking at, you can see the URL for chat with a genealogist. And one of our expert genealogists might, uh, this is free, uh, they might have some ideas for where you should look for uh, that sort of research problem. Um, so sometimes even when we don't always have that content in our databases, our genealogists can give you some great ideas for where to get started after that. Thanks. Uh, Barbara asks, if you don't know the address of where your ancestor lived in Boston, what's the best method to use to find them in the sacramental records? So I guess the question is, do you need to have the address to find them in the um, Boston Archdiocese records? I think that depends on whether you're using the free collection or the paid collection. Um, if you're an NEHGS member and you're using the fully searchable database, then you can just type in their name and see what appears. And you're right, it doesn't exactly matter what, you don't need to know the parish ahead of time. Uh, if you're working through the free browsable collection, it's basically like you can look through the book on our website. Um, so you would want to know like the rough, geographic area of the city and maybe the rough time period that your ancestor lived in because you're going to just end up looking through the books. Um, we Each of those books start with a page that we've added that shows you how to navigate the book. So some of them already have a print index. So you could jump from, uh, you know, the, I don't know, C last names to the actual page in the book where your ancestor appears 
and some of them don't have an index at all. So you're just going to be paging through and looking chronologically. And that's where that webinar that I talked with will give you some tips for how to navigate that database in detail. All right. Um, also, you mentioned that you know a lot of volunteers um, work and uh, work with us and help transcribe some of these records or scan records. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is that something that people can do from home? Or are you looking for new, more volunteers at this point? Yeah, I think the answer is we're always looking for new volunteers. It's just a question of how enthusiastically we're looking. Um, so I didn't put in a plug in the projects in process uh, because I didn't quite want uh, Rachel, our volunteer coordinator, to get overwhelmed with, um, with new volunteers. But if you're interested and passionate about genealogy, we're always interested in hearing from you. Um, so this is work that most of our volunteer program is happening at home right now. Um, it's usually indexing work where, you're, where you'll get a chunk of pages and a spreadsheet, and you'll be transcribing the information from the images into that spreadsheet to then make them searchable. And so our vo volunteer coordinator is Rachel Adams. Uh, her email is rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L dot Adams, A-D-A-M-S at N-E-H-G-S dot org. And she'd be happy to hear from you if you're interested. Um, some projects that she's working on include the vital records from the New England Historic Genealogical Register that we talked about. Um, we're transcribing some records from the Wyeth Funeral Home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're redoing some of our older databases to have uh, some improved indexing. And so those are, I believe, some small towns across Massachusetts that uh, we're working to re-index. So Rachel would have a lot more up-to-date information of exactly what she has to hand out next to be worked on. Great. Well, thank you again, Molly, for your um, always your great and enthusiastic presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. But if you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services team. You can learn more um, by contacting research at nehgs.org. Uh, Molly mentioned we also have a free service um, that's chat with a genealogist. It's Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesday, 9 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Again, the ser service is free. It's open to the public. You do not need to be a member of American Ancestors to um, talk with our genealogists. So if you're looking for um, a certain um, you know, time period or region, you're not sure what references or what resources might exist or maybe some um, tools that we have on our website, definitely use uh, that free service. And um, so thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider joining or making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create other free programs for you. If you'd like to access how, uh, more how-to resources or learn about upcoming educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.